And joining us now is Jeff Charlotte, a contributing editor for Vanity Fair and a best-selling author or editor of seven books, including C Street, The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy, as well as The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power, adapted into a Netflix documentary series, the winner of the National Magazine Award for Reporting, the Molly Ivins Prize, and the Outspoken Award, among other honors. He's the professor in the art of writing at Dartmouth College, and his latest article at Vanity Fair is, January the 6th was only the beginning. Welcome to Background Briefing, Jeff Charlotte. Hi, Ian. Good to be with you. Well, thanks for joining us, Jeff. And your Vanity Fair article really does explore the Great Divide, and it is both frightening and depressing in a way that how we are so divided. And I mean, I think you could make the case that we're living in a country where liberty is threatening life and the pursuit of happiness. We saw that at the July the 4th parade just outside of Chicago, where people were gunned down. But the people that you've profiled and spent time with and wrote about, they see liberty and freedom in a, in a completely different way, that we're not, uh, we're not being oppressed by too many guns, but where we need guns because we are oppressed. It's just so stark. It, it is indeed a gun culture um, uh, central to the, the, the story that, that I tell um, is a church in Yuba City, California, uh, called the Church of Glad Tidings, which is a sort of a, a, a mini mega church, uh, not super huge, but big. Um, and listeners may have heard of it because it sort of made national news a little while ago when General Michael Flynn visited and they presented him a custom made AR-15 rifle at the altar, which they, uh, with, about which he joked, he said, maybe I'll go find somebody in Washington. That's not the only gun in that church. That church, in fact, you sit there in the pews and the audience and, um, you know, they give the announcements before the service and, you know, Tuesday's women's group night and uh, there's a little kids group and so on. And then there's weekly militia training um, at a church. And the militia training is very explicitly in preparation for the war. They're divided and their number only in believing is coming or has already begun. But they, they embrace the concept of civil war. But what are they afraid of? Uh, they would frame it as that they are not afraid of anything. Um, which but is, why are they so heavily armed, Jeff? I mean, isn't that a... Don't you normally uh, have, have arms to protect yourself or defend yourself because you feel threatened? Well, right. At, they, they would say they're not afraid of anything because they're exuberant. They feel like they, uh, they were despondent after January 6th because, as the pastor said, you know, we took the castle... And then essentially everything melted into air. Um, they weren't able to hold it. But uh, now th that the service I attended, uh, they had a guest speaker, a guy most of your listeners probably never heard of, a guy named David Strait, uh, uh, who is uh, kind of a big deal in something called the sovereign citizen movement. Um, this is the idea that uh, citizens, that, that, that federal authority has no power over uh, private citizens, which say, if it sounds crackpot, a recent survey of uh, county sheriffs around the United States found that 40% of sheriffs actually subscribe to some version of this idea. Um, and David Strait came and he, he brought them what they interpret as good news. He said, in fact, uh, the fight's already happening. We are winning now. Don't worry. Biden's not really president. Trump is secretly president. Hillary Clinton uh, has already been executed. Um, and the crowd cheered. And he said, and if you, you've seen her on TV since, don't worry, that's just fake news, that's green screens. They're building one, new Guantanamos for journalists. The crowd loved this. Now, if this sounds so outlandish that it just seems aberrational, uh, I should say I, I drove across, the, the excerpt in Vanity Fair is just a, a part of something, a, a new book I have called The Undertow. I drove across the entire United States. That was last summer, I'm doing the same now. Um, and I find these views and variations of them everywhere. That wasn't the only militia church I attended. Um, uh, these ideas are becoming more and more widespread and mainstream, detached from the reality you and I inhabit, but uh, uh, summoning a, a much more frightening possibility. 
So it's really extraordinary to think that so many Americans, and particularly the ones that you profile, Jeff Charlotte, really believe that government equals tyranny. But I, on the other hand, <laughs> I'm assuming I live in the normal world, not necessarily team normal, but <laughs> the, the normal world. And it would seem to me that our government is becoming a tyranny of the minority via the Supreme Court making unpopular uh, rulings and deconstructing the administrative state, which will, and then if they take up this case that they took up the, on their last day in the next session, they could basically change the way elections are done in this country, ensuring a one-party state. And, of course, a lot of conservative Republicans went to Hungary, where the dictator there, Orban, is their model for a kind of dictatorship with a democratic patina. So, again, it's, it's just so extraordinary to think that we are in a country where the definitions of liberty, the definitions of reality are so bifurcated. Is there any possible way to bridge this, this gap? No, I, I don't think there is. And I think that's one of the... Um, I, I don't think that means civil war is inevitable. That was the question I sort of asked as I've been driving around, is I, I wanted to know what did people think of this possibility that seemed unimaginable to me at least 10 years ago. Um, and everywhere, people were either of two minds that it, they thought civil war is coming, and they um, some of them were sad about that, some of them were excited about it, um, and some of them thought it had already started. And I think the idea that so many liberals and uh, leftists and secular folks have, which is that there's some kind of key that we can turn that can unlock our reality for these other folks. There's some way we can find to explain to them uh, uh, our perspective that will make them embrace it. I find that actually almost as delusional as the ideas of folks who think Hillary Clinton has already been executed. It's delusional in the sense that it's not taking seriously what's happening. It's not taking seriously the hatreds of many of these folks. It's not taking seriously fascism. Fascism isn't an oops. Fascism is a choice. These people have chosen it. They understand that they have chosen it. They've embraced it. Um, and so how we move beyond this, I'm not sure, but I don't think, um, I don't think we're going to find the magic argument that makes everybody stand down. And again, I'm speaking with Jeff Charlotte, who's a contributing editor for Vanity Fair and a best-selling author and editor of seven books, including C Street, The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy, as well as The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power, adapted into a Netflix documentary series. He's the winner of the National Magazine Award for Reporting, the Molly Ivins Prize, and the Outspoken Award, among other honors, and is a professor in the art of writing at Dartmouth College. And his latest article at Vanity Fair is January 6th was only the beginning. So we are, as you point out, I think we're not heading into fascism, but there's a considerable part of the country that seems to be comfortable with it. And that would be represented by the Trump world, because essentially he tried a fascist coup on January the 6th. And ever since then has uh, peeled off I don't know what percentage of the country. Do we know exactly how many people live in Trump world and live in the world that you explored in your article that we're discussing here, Jeff Charlotte? I mean, I think those numbers are are can be misleading. So we know that he still has sort of, you know, uh, between 30 and 40 percent hardcore support, um, which is certainly enough uh, to take back government. Um, uh, but how many people live in Trump world? Well, that's a different number, right? Do we describe if uh, I've been uh, right now writing about the state of Wisconsin, right? Wisconsin is a blue state, Democratic governor, extreme right wing state legislature. And uh, uh, as of, you know, post row, uh, abortion is now illegal in the state. They reverted to an 1849 law, um, uh, no exceptions for rape or incest. Um, are they living in Trump world? Um, even with their Democratic governor, uh, arguably, in many ways, yes. And I think that's where those 
we, we understand the reality of growing fascism in America, not by counting heads, um, but by looking at spheres of control. Um, and, and it can be in surprising places. Like, as I say in the story, you know, I start in Sacramento and then go to Yuba City and in California. And these uh, in Sacramento, I began uh, at a, a rally for Ashley Babbitt, the woman who was the insurrectionist killed on January 6th by a Capitol Police officer. Uh, and the Proud Boys had showed up, um, as well as uh, a group of Antifa pro protesters. And they brawled in the streets and the police looked on, except when Antifa uh, threw a punch and then the police would charge. That's Sacramento, a blue city in a blue state. Is it Trump world? Uh, maybe. Maybe. I think it's 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 those those spheres are, are getting uh, more diffuse at the edges. But Jeff, were, were you able to understand the attraction to this man? Because I think you could make the case that you'd have to scour America to find a human being worse than Donald Trump. I mean, he's been a disastrous, incompetent, corrupt uh, president and a very destructive one. And he's still dividing the country. And we don't know the extent to which his, his relationship with Vladimir Putin makes him a tool of what Putin's main arm, aim with America is to divide it and turn Americans against each other. So we're obliging a malign foreign power. But that I don't think that that argument would get very far, neither would any argument. And you point out that you as a member of the press were treated with a great deal of hostility covering these uh, events that you've described in your Vanity Fair article. So I guess the question would be, do these people, have they invented a Donald Trump? Or is it because the their hostility to the mainstream media and, and liberals and Democrats is so intense that anything that the mainstream media or the Democrats say about Trump, that therefore drives them into his arms unquestioningly. What is it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I would say that uh, I think every president is an invention, right? You know, when we look at Donald Trump or Barack Obama, it's very hard for us to take the measure of the person. And our political system is not actually asking us to. It's asking us to sort of uh, understand this figure as a as a metaphor for one idea of how uh, our world might be. And I think um, part of what I wanted to do in the story was I mentioned this woman, Ashley Babbitt, this 34 year old woman from um, Southern California uh, who traveled to Washington on January 6 uh, and was killed as she was trying to climb through a window within the Capitol. She was shot. Um, she had voted for Obama twice, um, not been a terribly political person, but then on Halloween in 2016, she logged onto Twitter for the first time and wrote Donald Trump and hashtag love. Um, and she just fell so hard for Donald Trump. And so I wanted to understand a little bit of her journey, what brings this, this person um, uh, from one place to this precipice, very literally, still, uh, she was perched on a windowsill when she was shot and killed. Um, and, uh, you know, I think so many of the usual suspects appear. Uh, she got into QAnon. Um, she had a business that suffered a lot during um, uh, COVID and that uh, um, turned her against government as well. She was very, became an anti-maxer, masker. Um, she ran her business, she made some mistakes and ended up with an incredibly usurious loan um, and a court judgment against her. She blamed all these things. She looked for understanding and, and she found it in Donald Trump who promised her uh, these really simple solutions. She lived very close to the Mexican border. He told her that the problem was um, uh, that very border and people coming over and she started to believe this. And it becomes a kind of a feedback loop because once you get into that, you find more and more confirmation of these deluded ideas. Um, and it, it brings them 
into this world in which Trump is a truth teller, uh, a truth teller amongst liars. Um, but, you know, part of what I want to say in this story, too, and I, I do think I think it's very likely Trump will return. I think odds are pretty good. Uh, you'll, he'll be back in 24. Um, but uh, I was interested in the sort of post January 6th world. Um, this is Trumpism without Trump. It is bigger than Trump. Um, uh, and the people I spoke to, they love Trump, um, but they were going forward on the fascist project with or without him. Well, indeed, at the Saviors of the Liberty rally uh, in Sacramento that you describe, and a lot of them were open neo-Nazis, were they not? One had a SS tattoo, etc. He said, a white cop's nine-minute knee on a black man's neck, somebody's doing their job. A black cop split second shot at a white woman leading a mob assassination. So there's the the belief system, right? That it, it was okay to kill George Floyd, but uh, shooting Ashley Babbitt has turned her into a martyr. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 so much in in, in that little uh, moment there. Um, I should say that the officer who killed Ashley Babbitt was a. Uh, uh, a plainclothes lieutenant, uh, a black man named Michael Byrd. And that's actually sort of what prompted the story. As soon as I saw that, and I saw that in the right wing online sphere, they were going to turn this into a very old and, and horrible story in American life, which is innocent white womanhood under threat by a black man. This is the lynching story of American life. But I should say that that little uh, that statement is coming from um, a speaker uh, at the rally who was also uh, an indicted January 6th insurrectionist named George Riley, who uh, describes himself as a um, French Canadian Iroquois Jew. He is a, a, a Native American Jew. He then adds for Jesus um, because he's converted to Christianity. Um, and, and yet he's embracing this idea of white supremacy and I think one of the things that I learned on this trip um, was that the sort of the American innovation of fascism, which is uh, fundamentally white supremacist, was to find a way in which uh, non-white people um, uh, can be seduced by this promise of whiteness and, and drawn into it. So at that rally, for instance, uh, many of the folks I met were, were Latinx and wanted it understood that their movement is much more diverse than a lot of uh, liberals think it is. And that's true. It is. It is. It's also fundamentally white supremacist. Both things are true at the same time. That's the American innovation on fascism, which is sort of uh, decoupling it from a strictly uh, racial purist project in service of a larger white supremacist project. And we continue the conversation with Jeff Charlotte, contributing editor for Vanity Fair and a best-selling author or editor of seven books, including C Street, The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy, as well as The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power, adapted into a Netflix documentary series, and the winner of the Nash the winner of the National Magazine Award for Reporting, the Molly Ivins Prize, and the Outspoken Award, among other honors. He's a professor in the art of writing at Dartmouth College, and his latest article in Vanity Fair is January the 6th was only the beginning. So we can't close the divide, and, and you mentioned uh, the multiracial nature of the Trump world and, the, and these right-wing militias and those that are talking about the inevitability of a civil war. Enrique Tarrio, the leader of the Proud Boys, is a dark-skinned um, Cuban. So what's the transgression then from the world of Ashley Babbitt, joined the Air Force at 17, had a, uh, was married to a guy who seemed quite normal and didn't understand her love affair with Trump, and that kind of profile... And then you got the, on the other hand, you got the the sort of more, you know, redneck, a tattooed Nazi type element as well. So how do those, how do they cohabit, or what's the mix there between the kind of suburbanites who get radicalized and the people that have always been out there on the fringes of the far right? You know, I mean, I think. Uh... I would sort of pause at that 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 term redneck and think it's probably uh, the 
the particular guy that we're describing with the SS tattoos, a man named Victor Knight, um, who uh, is uh, with his wife, Chelsea. Uh, his, uh, his wife, Chelsea, is just a, an, one of the organizers of Placer County for Trump, a um, uh, big sort of suburban Californian county. Um, uh, the, I, I, I don't think redneck is the term. Um, I think the radicalization is so much more widespread um, than than that. I think the Yuba City Church is a kind of rural church. Uh, later in the story, in the book, The Undertow, uh, I attend uh, another militia church in Omaha, Nebraska. Omaha is a city. Uh, the church was probably about 30 percent black. And if anything, it was more extreme further, much further to the right. Um, uh, they were convinced that all media was demonic um, and asked me to leave. Uh, armed men came out and said, you've got to leave. Um, and uh, so I think that radicalization uh, uh, and apocalypticism uh, just sort of runs runs so much more broadly. And, and I don't think that we can look at it uh, it's it's the terrible mistake I think of the American left is to dismiss it as 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 rednecks or hillbillies or hayseeds or this sort of country fringe. Um, as we're talking right now, I've been uh, thinking about a family I just met in Wisconsin from suburban Eau Claire. A wonderful, nice-looking young family. Until you get start talking to them about their beliefs, their armory. They have 35 guns. They're ready for civil war. Um, they are very excited about the overturning of Roe. Um, they uh, would like to see abortion providers uh, executed. Um, this well, is not. I feel that the University of Chicago did did uh, an, uh, some really uh, good analysis of the people who did storm the Capitol on January the sixth, and that supports exactly what you said. Even though we saw some some sort of tattooed characters and the guy with the horns and all that stuff they were the in a way the minority of people they were more like the people that you just uh, described with so let's sort of try and focus then jeff charlotte on the face of not just the face of american fascism but what motivates it if it's not racist like the nazis and targeting the jews etc Oh, it's racist. It, I don't want to say it's not racist. It's a white supremacist project, mm. um, one that does not exclude non-white people. It, I see. Uh, um, it, you know, that's why we have leaders like Ali Alexander and uh, Enrique Terrio and um, uh, in Sacramento, George Riley, uh, Native American man, and and uh, you know, throughout uh, militia churches that are are quite diverse and so on. Um, it, it is absolutely racist. And wherever you go, you'll find um, the fear of so-called critical race theory. And you'll find anger over uh, George Floyd, not that he was killed, but that people were allowed to demonstrate over it. Um, uh, you'll find the Blue Lives Matter flag, the American flag um, drained of color, but for one blue stripe down the middle, um, created it's it, the man who made it told me as a rebuttal to black lives matter um uh you'll find uh uh police officers of color flying that flag um uh it's not to say it's not racist but that racism is is uh the racism of this movement is is more complicated than clansmen in robes well you you're naturally drawn to historical analogies with the nazis so where's the kind of historical grudge that that motivated the ordinary Germans to join the Nazi party, the, feel, the feeling that the country had been mistreated. Who were the scapegoats in the American version of fascism? Uh, I mean, the scapegoats are many for some, uh, uh, you know, and, and it's, I think one of the important things to recognize is it's constantly mutating. It's constantly changing. Right now, the target of the right is trans kids. Um, and they're focusing tremendous energy on that. So we've got Proud Boys who are focusing on that, who didn't give it a thought two years ago, right? Um, uh, two years ago, they were talking about a migrant caravan. 
uh, of uh, undocumented peoples. Um, that was the great enemy. And if we go back a few more years, they were talking about Muslims, um, uh, the Muslim ban. That was the enemy. The point is not any specific enemy. It's to have an enemy. The enemy can mutate and change, and that's what makes the, the movement fluid and flexible. For Ashley Babbitt, this formerly democratic kind of kind of like beach hippie her her thing was uh, the shaka she liked to fly the shaka sign you know with a pinky out and thumb out she was a very laid back person her favorite movie was the big lebowski she doesn't fit this profile but for her she became really radicalized by the QAnon conspiracy theory that 800,000 children are being uh, kidnapped and taken away a year this is not true uh, if it was you would notice every school in America would be losing kids on a regular basis. Um, uh, but so for her, uh, the enemy became this kind of amorphous child stealer. Now, a lot of these stories are partaking of uh, old anti-Semitism, uh, the blood libel, the idea that uh, Jews make, this is an old anti-Semitic myth that um, the Jews make matzah out of the blood of Christian children. And, and mm. makes no sense, but people believe this. That's being recycled. And uh, many people don't know uh, that it comes from that. I just recently interviewed a man in Wisconsin who uh, was talking about globalist banker conspiracies and child stealing and so on. And so I just asked him, you know, I wanted to know if he was anti-Semitic and he was absolutely puzzled. He said, what, what do Jews have anything to do with this? <laughs> he was he was pretty much reciting the classic anti-Semitic text, the protocols of the elders of Zion. Right. Well, but just it, in the it, last minute though, Jeff, we've run, run out of time. I just wanted to get a sense just in closing here of the idea that they've, that the people you profile are either wanting a civil war or, or expecting a civil war. So is there a sense then, since it's irreconcilable, the country is is hopelessly divided and there's no way in post-truth America through rational discourse and reason to bridge the gap. So therefore, do these people want, if they can't live with the rest of us, do they want to purge us? Uh some do and you know i think it's important to rec they don't think that they can't live with the rest of us they think they are the majority um they think it's us who can but what do they want us to do go away disappear convert or die well i thank you for joining us uh, jeff charlotte your work is invaluable and you're very brave and i appreciate what you do thanks ian and again, I've been speaking with Jeff Charlotte, who's a contributing editor for Vanity Fair and a best-selling author or editor of seven books, including Sea Street, The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy, as well as The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power, adapted into a Netflix documentary series, the winner of the National Magazine Award for Reporting, the Molly Ivins Prize, and the Outspoken Award, among other honors. He's a professor in the art of writing at Dartmouth College, and his latest article at Vanity Fair is January the 6th, 